Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our event, Beyond Instagram, Engaging Citizens in Science. I'm Seamus Doherty, and tonight I'll be your host. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a doctorate student from Flinders University here in South Australia, and I'm the co-creator of many citizen science projects, including the Great Southern Bioblitz. Tonight I'll be accompanied by doctorate student Larissa Souza, as well as scientist and citizen science guru Stephen Fricker from the University of South Australia. Today, we're going to explore what citizen science is, how it is being used in conservation, learning and public health, and more importantly, how you can get involved. To start off the night, we'll be showcasing our film, Mozzie Monitors, The Power of Citizen Science, publicly for the first time. We will then be given a short documentary, uh, a short presentation by host speaker Rissa on the Mozzie Monitors Citizen Science Project. We'll then be accompanied by Stephen Fricker, we will discuss the Global City Nature Challenge and the success story of Australia's involvement in its first year. Shortly after this, I will then be giving a presentation on the up and coming citizen science event, the Great Southern Bioblitz. Finally, we'll be closing off the night with a live Q&A, accompanied by all hosts to answer all of your interesting questions. So without any further delay, may it be my pleasure to present to you our short documentary film that was selected for the Cinema uh, International Science Film Festival, Mozzie Monitors, the power of citizen science. Enjoy. Know what the deadliest animal on earth is? If you're thinking of sharks, spiders, or snakes, you may be mistaken. It's actually mosquitoes. Millions of people are exposed to mosquito borne diseases daily across the globe. Around 400,000 people die every year due to malaria, especially in Africa. Last year in the Americas alone, almost 3 million people had dengue fever, an increase of 600% compared to previous years. The incidence of mosquito-borne diseases in Australia has been increasing significantly over the last 10 years, and this is expected to continue. There seem to be no borders that stop the spread of disease all over the world, and the enemy may be sleeping with us. The World Health Organization has set some goals to tackle infectious diseases globally, the focus being on managing dangerous mosquitoes and engaging communities. A community aware of disease risk is a community able to take actions to eliminate container breeding sites and report the occurrence of invasive species in their local areas. With these concerns in mind, Mozzie Monitors was launched in 2018 in Australia. It is a citizen science-based mosquito surveillance program which aims to engage the community to set up mosquito traps in their neighbourhoods. In the Mozzie Monitors program, people collect the mosquitoes they've trapped and send in pictures every fortnight or month. Researchers then collect and process data on the mosquitoes and make it available on a free-to-use online platform where members of the program can learn about their neighbourhood's mosquito abundance, diversity, disease risk and ecology. The Mozzie Monitors team have engaged these citizen scientists through social media platforms, creating budding mosquito experts. I have never really been worried about infectious diseases transmitted by, by mosquitoes, but I recently travelled to Fiji a few years ago and we had to be really careful there about protecting ourselves from uh, the Zika virus. And that made me really aware of the dangers of infectious diseases coming to Australia. I decided to get into, uh, involved in Mozzie Monitors because I was interested to learn more about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes aren't something that we hear much about in our daily lives. They're kind of a disliked species and I just wanted to learn a bit more about them. So since joining Mozzie Monitors, I found out actually lots of information about mosquitoes and I found out there's a lot more species than I originally knew. And I'm actually able to now identify a few of the different common species in my backyard. 
I think the Mozzie Monitors program is a really clever initiative. I think it's really good to let the public know and learn about how they can actually help with um, mosquitoes and mosquito problems. And I've actually learned about ways that I can help in my own backyard by emptying out containers of water so that there's not a breeding ground there for mosquitoes. Thanks to people like Nicole, we collected more than 10,000 mosquitoes in the first year of Mozzie Monitors. Many among these can potentially carry diseases. Now we are going to launch Mozzie Monitors in Brazil, upscaling in a more challenging environment with higher disease risk to help people like Priscilla who are exposed to diseases like dengue. Well, my experience with dengue was nothing agradable. São, os sintomas são as fortes dores de cabeça, fortes dores musculares, vermelhidão pelo corpo inteiro, uma coceira, você não sabe se coça ou se arde o local, principalmente nas palmas das mãos, nas solas do pé. Você não sente vontade de comer nada, não tem vontade de fazer nada, é só aquela dor constante, sempre na cabeça, atrás dos olhos, no braço, nas pernas, aquela coceira que não sabe nada acessa, né? E as únicas recomendações médicas é tomar água e repouso, né? Não tem o que se faça para para amenizar esses sintomas. Né? E nesse mesmo período que eu tive dengue, minha mãe também teve dengue. E assim, a gente sofreu junto, aquela dor de cabeça, aquela dor no corpo, porque assim, não dá para explicar a intensidade da dor, né? Não é uma dor de cabeça normal, é uma dor de cabeça muito, muito forte, né? E assim, a preocupação quando teve a zika, o chikungunya no Brasil, é da gente pegar de novo, né? Ter os sintomas de novo. E aí é muito preocupante, por isso a gente toma sempre cuidado, usando repelente, People in Brazil, as well as other tropical countries, are exposed to mosquito-borne diseases daily, with some neighbourhoods being overwhelmed, leaving residents in a state of fear. Actively engaging the public in mosquito surveillance through citizen science can empower communities and improve public health literacy outcomes. A hands-on citizen science approach to mosquito monitoring can transform locals into community champions enhancing disease risk assessments and breeding site elimination. In expanding Mozzie monitors to more challenging contexts, we expect to demonstrate that a citizen science-based program of mosquito surveillance is a framework for community resilience. The world is changing. The climate is changing. And the speed that diseases spread to new areas is changing as well. Citizen science could be essential in the fight against vulnerability in different contexts. I would just like to take this moment to, and thank everyone who was involved with the making of that film. Um, so talking more about the Mozzie Monitors project, please let me introduce you to Larissa from UniSA. Hello everyone, my name is Larissa. I am doing my PhD research at the University of South Australia. We're really happy to share a little bit about the story of Mozzie Monitors with all of you, because we know that mosquitoes are everywhere and very often they are in our backyards as well. That's why we really believe it's important to have a citizen science program where people can participate in mosquito surveillance from their houses, from their backyards. So that's why we started Mozzie Monitors in 2018. And I'm going to share some of the first outcomes of the Mozzie Monitors program with all of you. Just a second. So Mozzie Monitors is a citizen science initiative and citizen science is the public participation in scientific research. It unites the expertise from educators, scientists, data managers, policy makers, and members of the community as well. The citizen science can help generate big data by overcoming some logistical and geographical barriers. So in other words, citizen science brings members of the community and researchers together 
in programs of local, national, and global importance. And thinking of local and global importance, we know that mosquito-borne diseases are a major problem. Millions of people are exposed to mosquito-borne diseases all over the world, especially dengue and malaria, and over one million people die every year because of these diseases. Most of them are kids under the age of five. And as there is no vaccination for the most of these diseases, the most effective way to prevent them is still by controlling mosquito populations or by managing the mosquito populations. So a citizen science initiative could have a great potential to assist local health authorities in this mosquito surveillance. Uh, just a fast fact, around 40% of the world's population is at risk of contracting dengue. And this number is increasing in different places and at different rates as well. Last year, around 3 million people had dengue fever just in the Americas. And in the beginning of last year as well, this number started increasing again in Australia, in central Queensland. So with the Muslim Monitors program, members of the community can help in mosquito surveillance by uh, setting up a mosquito trap in their backyards, collecting the mosquitoes by using this trap, and taking photos of these mosquitoes, as you could see on the video, and send it to us every week. So we can count and identify these species and we make the data available. We also keep this engagement through our social media, where everyone is able to ask questions or share some news about mosquitoes or mosquito-borne diseases. And we also have some discussion about how to prevent or how to fight the bite. Uh, with this citizen science program on mosquito surveillance, we are increasing the knowledge on mosquito community composition in Australia. And we are also raising an awareness of disease risk. So with that, we expect to help building healthier environments and healthier communities. And at this moment, we are assessing the edu educational gains from people's participation into this program. And we are also exploring the possibility to upscale mother monitors to other local communities. Uh, in this season, we are comparing data collected by, by mouse monitors, by citizen scientists, into different locations in South Australia and in Western Australia. Uh, our current trial in Western Australia is finishing in two weeks from now, so we are going to have some new information soon to share. Uh, but this year, we are assessing data collected in two different ways. So some people are using traps, as you could watch on the video, and some people are sharing their daily observations of mosquitoes by using a mobile phone app, GI Naturalist, which is a citizen science platform used all over the world to share observations of biodiversity. So, so far, the most common species collected are species of medical importance, especially some mosquitoes related to the transmission of Rosewood virus and Vermophorest in Australia. And we also collected some species related to the transmission of Murray Valley encephalitis, and even uh, a specific species related to the historical transmission of malaria inside Australia. The most of them are container breeding species, so they use artificial water containers in people's backyards to breathe. Uh, as I said, we also have some, there, there is also a group of people uh, who are sharing their observations by using the iNaturalist app. So this is a citizen science app or a citizen science platform where everybody can share their observations of biodiversity. So any animal, plant, or fungi. And they can also share some information related to the date, time, and the geographical place, the GPS information where this observation was made. So there are many different projects in, on this platform. So we created a Muslim Monitors group on this platform on the iNaturalist. And so far, we have had over 1,000 observations of 45 different species. Uh, something really interesting about the iNaturalist 
is that the app uses the, this GPS information to create a map of species distribution. So wherever there was an observation of this species, uh, we can see the relocation on this map here. So we can see how these observations are distributed around Australia. So this is a really important information as well to understand the mosquito fauna in Australia. Uh, as the first outcome, the next step, uh, we have found that people are able to collect mosquitoes of medical importance in their backyards by using the traps. And they are also able to share observations of mosquitoes of medical importance. Uh, from surveys and interviews, we have found that people are also able to learn about mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases as well by participating in citizen science initiatives like mouse and monitors. And as next step, we are going to upscale mouse and monitors to Brazil by the beginning of next year, as you could watch on the video. But at this moment, we needed to postpone this next step to Brazil because of the pandemic. But we are planning our next step to upscale mass monitors to other local communities in Australia. So please follow us on our social media to get the next update about our next trial in the next summer. Uh, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Craig, Catherine, and Cameron, and also a special thanks to Stephen and Seamus, who are a big part of this program. And thank you everyone for listening as well. Thank you for that presentation, Larissa. And for those interested in learning a bit more about the Mozzie Monitors project or simply want to get involved, um, check out the chat now for links to that project. So next up, now we have a great presentation by Stephen Fricker from the University of South Australia as well. Stephen will be talking about the Global City Nature Challenge and the success of Australia's first time participating in the challenge. On to you, Stephen. Thanks, Seamus. Um, my name is Stephen Fricker. I'm, uh, I've been working in citizen science at the University of South Australia for a few years. And uh, out of this work, um, I uh, became exposed to something called the uh, City Nature Challenge. Now, the City Nature Challenge uses the platform iNaturalist, which I've been using for a little while, uh, to engage citizen scientists in observing urban biodiversity around the world. Uh, now, I'll, I'm just going to have a quick talk to you about that. I've got a little presentation, so it just takes me a little second to uh, bring that up. Okay, um, just brought that up now. So um, the, uh, the City Nature Challenge in 2020 um, was held for the first time in Australia uh, and Greater Adelaide participated. And this was held in um, the end of April, uh, our autumn. Uh, and it is generally a, it's a, it's a global urban biodiversity uh, biblets. Uh, the, um, the City Nature Challenge, what is it? You, I've sort of talked briefly about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explain a bit more about what this is all about and the philosophy behind it and go short, uh, into what we did here in a minute. Uh, the, um, the City Nature Challenge allows people to connect with local nature or facilitates the connection between people and nature. It also uh, facilitates the connection between, uh, between people uh, and um, this can be done through in-person um, connections and also online. Now this year it was mainly online because of the COVID situation, uh, which unfortunately uh, limited what we could do. Uh, it also allows us to collect urban biodiversity data from around the world and compare. But it also uh, encourages us to have fun in a, um, in a friendly, collaborative way. And for local communities and um, government, it allows them to uh, grow their, uh, their capacity uh, with volunteers, their skills and their, uh, their ability to, um, to engage with, um, with citizen science. Oh, that's probably a bit better. Sorry about that. Um, now, uh, just a bit of history about what's been going on with the, um, the City Nature Challenge uh, and why we decided to get involved. Now, the, uh, the City Nature Challenge um, first started in 2016 uh, with a friendly competition between two cities in the US as a part of their Citizen Science Week. Uh, it was LA and um, San Francisco. And um, their goal was to increase the user base of the new app, um, 
uh, iNaturalist, which has been sort of plugging along for a few years. And that, that actually happened. So there was a bit of an increase there in the, um, in the, in the usage of the app. Uh, and there was, they made a lot of observations over the, over the week-long period that they did that in. And the following year, they, they, it was successful. So they had a, bit, a few inquiries from other people around the country. So uh, they increased the number of uh, uh, cities that were being involved. And um, that, of course, increased the user base. And importantly, it also con they continued to use the app once they became uh, familiar with it. And then the next year, the same thing happened. We started becoming a bit more international. And then uh, last year, again, it became more and more international Where I, when I sort of noticed it. And um, at the end of last year, I, uh, I got together with a guy called Phil Roten from Burnside Council. Uh, if you're involved in citizen science, particularly in South Australia, you'd know the guy. Um, so um, we, we sort of had a bit of a discussion uh, at the end of the year uh, get together for the Citizen Science Association. And we thought, well, why not? So we decided to get Adelaide involved. Uh, and ha as it happens, uh, this was the first time that any Australian city had been involved, but also there were actually three other like-minded cities uh, or areas. They were the uh, Redlands Council the oh, um, area, uh, the uh, Sydney, Greater Sydney area, and um, there were some people from down in, uh, in Geelong in uh, Victoria. They were also very involved, very interested about being involved. And what I like about this sort of uh, this sort of event, it allows different people from different backgrounds to get together and uh, and enjoy nature. And often, when you do that, you see different things. One person will be looking down at a at a butterfly or an orchid, uh, and other people might be looking at a plant or a bird that's flying by. And in doing so, you make more observations and you you, you share interests and you you educate people uh, who have different backgrounds um, than you with your knowledge and they give you a, a, a different perspective on, on things that you might not have thought about or, uh, or that you might not know about. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, this guy here, Robert Lawrence, who's really, really hot on orchids. And I've always had an interest in orchids, but I've never really had a chance to um, really, or not a chance, but I've just never really uh, pursued that too much. But Robert's really sparked an interest in that for myself, just on a personal note. Uh, now, was this successful? Now, that's an interesting question. How do you, how do you, um, how do you uh, measure success? Well, in, um, in the, the City Nature Challenge, I think we were quite successful by a number of metrics. One of the things was there was a, a record increase in the number of, of new observers in the Greater Adelaide in South Australia, um, and particularly the Greater Adelaide area during the month that the uh, City Nature Challenge was uh, was being held. So if you look here, you can see there's the number of new users uh, over the years from 2018. And then you hit the last one, which is the uh, uh, when the City Nature Challenge was, was on, and it was, well, over double the previous month. And that was through the awareness that came with the City Nature Challenge, the, um, the work we did with social media and um, also engaging with, um, with local community groups. Uh, we also had um, nearly 200 observers involved, which is not a huge number, but they were very prolific with uh, nearly 7,000 observations and um, over 1,200 species. We also had a number of observers um, from around the country, uh, sorry, identifiers from around the country getting involved, and they, um, they helped us do some IDs on some tricky animals, which some of the observers may not have known about. And that brings about this sort of collaborative approach to, to um, the citizen science. Now, um, what did we see? We saw plenty of these guys, the, um, the magpie. They were one of the most observed animals um, by far uh, around the, the greater Adelaide area, which is not surprising because they seem to be everywhere and, you know, lovely birds they are. Um, we also saw... Uh, plenty of fairy wrens. I think there was about 30 or 40 of those observed, um, which is uh, fantastic because I, I try and find one of these every time I go out. They're a beautiful, charismatic bird, which uh, everyone loves. Um, we also saw plenty of um, water birds around our urban wetlands, um, such as this little um, swamp hen, and um, rainbow lorikeets, which are everywhere. So they tend to be pretty high up in the trees sometimes, so they're hard, hard to observe, but they are one of the most observed organisms as well. Uh, and also we saw plenty of insects. This is one of the most observed insects. Reduced 
uh, insect. But this is important as we know, we need to know what the common things are doing and what the, the invasive species are doing. And um, and that's one of the good things about iNaturalist. We can observe all the uh, the common things like the magpies because one day they might not be that common anymore. Now, this information um, uh, tends to um, get people a bit confused as to, to what it's been used for. Now, all of the information gathered from something uh, like iNaturalist can go to the uh, Atlas of Living Australia, which is a large database uh, that can be accessed by scientists to look at the distribution of animals around, um, around the country. Uh, and it's very useful for uh, all sorts of scientific endeavours that we, we may not even know about. So uh, that's why I like this sort of uh, platform because it, um, and this sort of event because it engages uh, new people in, in doing citizen science. And rather than just posting their pictures to Instagram, they can use those, uh, those great or not so great pictures to, uh, to further our scientific knowledge when they go out for a walk. And it also can stimulate people to go out to new places and see new things because there might be something there that they have come across on iNaturalist, a flower or a bird that they haven't seen before. So they may, uh, may wish to go and see that. So how do they do that? They use iNaturalist to find out where these things have been observed and they can go and try and find these things for themselves. So I think it can have a, a great uh, uh, a, a great opportunity here for us to to use this app to to engage people more in nature and observe biodiversity. And in, when they when they do observe the biodiversity and become more more knowledgeable about what's out there, they're more willing to protect it, which is uh, something that I think is a very important thing going forward. Okay, now um, that's enough for me. I think I'll put you back on to uh, to Seamus. Thank you for that presentation, Stephen. So moving on from our success in the City Nature Challenge, I'm very much keen to discuss our up and coming citizen science event, the Great Southern Bioblitz. So what is it? Well, the Great Southern Bioblitz, otherwise known as GSV, is an international period of intense biological surveying. And by definition, that is what a bioblitz is. Now, this event was created to achieve two things. The first being to highlight the biodiversity of wild plants and animals that can be, that can be found throughout the Southern Hemisphere during the springtime. The other being to engage the public in science and nature learning. That is to engage those who um, may have not been involved with citizen science before, those who haven't used the iNaturalist system before, and to really help um, promote nature learning, so learning about the different animals and plants found in people's local areas and to help with identification and data collection. So when and where is the Bioblitz? Well, as the name might indicate, the Great Southern Bioblitz is across the entire Southern Hemisphere. And this will run between uh, September 25th, 28th this year. That is, the surveying will happen between those dates. After that, we will then do the identifications for those observations. And this will incorporate different communities, areas and regions found across the entire Southern Hemisphere. So, so far we have, I think, roughly over 65 regions who have um, registered interest in the Great Southern Bioblitz. So that spans anywhere from Australia, ourselves, um, especially South America, um, to all sorts of different places found all over the world. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about that and how you can get involved with your local area. So how do you get involved? Well, the biggest thing that you'll need to do is to register an account on the iNaturalist platform. Now, this is very easy to do. They have both iOS and Android applications for iNaturalist. Otherwise, you can register on their website on your computer. All you have to do for this is to take a photo of any wild, specifically wild, plant or animal between September 25th and the 28th and submit that onto the platform. Now, if you'd like to get involved with your local area, we have a number, as mentioned before, we have a number of regions who have already expressed um, their interest or have already created a project for the Great Southern Wildlands in which you can join them and represent your region. 
Otherwise, you don't have to join any project. Any observation made between those dates will automatically be picked up for, for our event. Now, if your region doesn't have a project already set up for the Great Southern Bioblitz, we do encourage that you create one. We have a great guide on our website, which I'll show in a second on how to do that. Um, and that would allow you to also um, you know, get more people involved in your area. Um, so be that your local, you know, ecological community, it can be your little town, it could be your entire state, it could be an entire country. We accommodate everyone. So if you want to find out more, I really encourage you that uh, to follow us on social media, be that on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at GS Bioblitz. Otherwise, if you want to get some more in-depth information, or maybe you want to share it with a friend, or a family member, uh, I encourage you to go on our website there at the bottom. You can learn how to register an account, how to get involved. There are even some great blogs we've made on there, for some tips for the Great Southern Wire Blitz. Literally everything you need to know will be on that website. Otherwise, if you want to ask some questions tonight, I encourage you to put them in the chat below and we will uh, endeavour to answer those later on. Thanks. Now. All right, so now we're going to do a live Q&A, guys. So if you have any questions that you have for a presentation, be that on any of the projects that we've discussed tonight or anything citizen science related, um, put them in the chat now and we're going to answer them to the best of our ability. So I've got Larissa here monitoring the chat for me. Do we have any um, questions coming in, Larissa, yet? Um, just a second. I think there is one question here from uh, Vinicius Zalotta. Uh, he's asking, can I share my photos of wildlife on my naturalist, even if they are not professional quality? Stephen, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, with, um, we're taking photographs. The important thing is that you take good quality photographs for ID. So that generally means they need to be as in focus as possible. Sometimes it could be hard to get things totally in focus. We're dealing with small animals, but um, or, or ones that are very, very fast. Um, as long as they're ID quality, we're not looking for Instagram um, pictures with you know fantastic you know, scenery and things. What we're looking for is an ability to make positive ID. So uh, we need to look at the features. So it's often with things like plants, for example, like eucalypts, we want to look at things like uh, the flowers, the leaves, the bark is very important with eucalypts as well, and also the um, the fruiting body, the cap. So we want to be able to see the sort of the shape and, and, and the structure there, and then the experts on our naturalists, which there are there are a few who are very good at eucalypts, can ID those. Um, with some insects, it's people often take a photograph from the top with a lot of flies and things, uh, particularly with mosquitoes. And uh, with our Mighty Monolith project, on, on the of course they they tend to take a picture of a mosquito from the from the top. And unfortunately, that's that's pretty hard because to ID because you can't actually see any of the of the features. You're more likely to, to see them if you can see them on the side or on an angle. And then you can see this cuts on the side of the animal, and you can see the, the bands on the legs. So generally, we want to have um, photos that may not necessarily be great for for Instagram. And you might have gone out and gone for a nice walk and taken several photographs of all these uh, these beautiful animals, and you want to put a few of those on Instagram. And you've got these other ones that are not so good for Instagram, for example, or for your Facebook page. Um, but they're very good for things like um, for iNaturalist so we can find out uh, what species are about and what you saw on your walk. So uh, yeah, so that I would say in short to sum up, um, you don't have to do professional quality photographs, but it's important that they show the features that we need, yeah. Mm. 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 
Yeah, that's for sure. And I'll just get something that's just over here. Some of you might have heard of something called Wild Orchid Watch. And precisely for that reason, a lot of people like orchids and they like to take nice photographs and then edit their photographs and post them. So they've developed this little card that you can't see because we've got the background. There you go. Uh, sorry, I've got a fancy background on. I'm not really in space. Oh, that didn't work. I thought that might have worked. But what it is, it's a little card with a measurement on there and a, and a color palette. So they can tell if the colors have been adjusted. Um, and you can get them from the Wild Orchid Watch people. So I, I would thoroughly recommend that you get one of these. They're great for taking photographs of small animals or plants. And you can use those for your eye naturalist or other uh, things as well. So you can take a nice photograph to edit and then take some with your little picture to, um, to use. I, unfortunately, I take mine out in the field and I always leave it though. Um, but uh, it is brightly colored. So I, I often, oh, I always find it when I go back, but uh, it's a great thing to have something like that. Yeah, great. So do we have any other questions, Larissa, in the chat there? Um, no, not in the chat, on, but actually. actually we have, we, we received some questions uh, last week during the first event. Uh, yes. There is one question from Tim. Uh, he's asking, how can citizens or average people develop the ability to provide more accurate observations? Let me just get that question up. So the question was, how can citizens slash average people develop the ability to provide more accurate observations? Yeah. So in terms of creating um, ac accurate observations, we're talking about location here. I don't know, Stephen, if you wanted to chime in at all. I'm not, is that is that what they're asking? Uh, not sure, but I think maybe it's something related to what Stephen was talking about right now. Are we talking about identification? Pictures which are more uh, able to be identified, maybe? Um, more, how to take pictures that are more uh, more identifiable. Is that what you're saying, Marissa? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's okay. the question. Yeah, yeah okay. So um, there are some resources on the, on the iNaturalist website that do instruct you on how to do these sorts of things, some nice little short videos. But it really does depend on the, um, on the actual organism. So, for example, birds. Um, a lot of birds are very easily identifiable because, they, well, there's a, there's a few reasons for that, because they're often quite distinct. And they're often fairly charismatic. So a lot of the birds that we have, they, they, they have a lot, they're, they're fairly flashy, like one of my favorite birds, the, um, the superb fairy wren. You know, it, it's very colorful. It's got these big patches of color and, and you can work out what it is. Some of them are a bit more, um, a, a bit harder to tell the difference, but because there's such a, a, um, a wide community of birders out there, they can easily identify them with these certain little color patches on the, on the body. With smaller animals like, um, so they might only need say one picture or two pictures. So for, um, for smaller animals like insects, if you can, it's good to get a side view and a top view. With some of the insects, it can be very difficult to get down to species. It, 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 they sometimes require a bit of um, microscopic work where you have to dissect out certain parts to work out exactly what species they are. So if you can get down to genus on a lot of those um, um, insects, it's, it's quite good. Um, with plants, it's always good to remember, you know, what parts of a, what parts make up a plant. So you have things like you have the leaf. Uh, so you want a, a decent picture of the leaf, how it's attached to the stem is often important. Uh, if it's a larger plant, the type of bark that the tree has is, is often an important thing because similar, some trees that have very, very similar leaves can have completely different bark. So that makes, quite, makes it quite easy to, um, to identify flowers if they're in flowers or if they're not in flower as well. So often it can be um, a feature of a plant that it's, uh, it tends to flower at a certain time of the year. So if it is flowering, it's very important to get that flower and that helps, I'll get a picture of the flower and it helps with other things as well, um, like looking at the phenology um, of, of organisms and plants. So when organisms are in a certain life stage uh, and that can be important further down, the, further down the line when we want to do research on, on this sort of um, data that we're collecting. Um, also, uh, it, it can be important with some plants 
to give a description of the habitat. So often a broader picture of the habitat, I wouldn't be putting it as the first picture, but a broader picture of the habitat can sometimes help with ID, um, particularly where you've got plants that are, have very specific habitat requirements. And um, I have seen uh, often on, on things like both, uh, like iNaturalist or on, on Twitter or on Facebook where people have asked, you know, can you ID this? And one of the questions is, oh, you know, one of the return questions is it could be three or four species. Do you know the habitat type? So if it's growing on the top of a hill or down in the swale, that can be important as well. So to get good pictures, you need to get uh, pictures of the different features and that'll be, de that'll be determined by the type of animal that you're looking at or plant that you're looking at. And sometimes the habitat type or what, what the animal, what kind of plant the animal is on. And that's the good thing about um, iNaturalist. What you can do is you can actually, often when you're taking pictures of insects on plants, you can make two observations at once. One is the plant and one is the insect or the bird. And you can link those observations. And that's important for a number of these actual citizen science projects that utilize the platform like Oz pollinators, or um, there's another one as well called, uh, which looks at Oz pollinators, sorry, looks at um, insect and plant interactions. And um, the other one you could look at is uh, uh, there's one called uh, hungry parrots, which looks at parrots and what they are feeding on to get an idea as to um, what kind of uh, what, uh, habitat requirements are, uh, are necessary for maintaining uh, uh, parrot populations around Australia. So these sort of interactions are quite important um, to record on iNaturalist and they are good ways to actually help with making good IDs. Thanks for that, Stephen. Yeah, that's a great answer. So I might move on to the next question now. Um, we have um, another question sent in. Uh, Shemo, can I just say, we yes. have two more questions on the live chat. Oh, okay, yeah, let's do them. Uh, one question is from Vinicius. Uh, he says, I have hundreds of wildlife photos that I've taken in the past year. Can I upload these old photos on the iNet app? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll answer that if you want, Stephen. Um, yeah, so with iNaturalist, it's great. So you can upload old photos. Um, any time, you know, if they were from years ago, um, before the platform even existed, you could upload photos from that era. Um, and it's really easy. So if you go, um, I would encourage you to probably go into the um, web version of iNaturalist um, and you can just gather all your photos on your computer and literally drag them over and upload those. Um, if you don't have the location, you might have to put that in manually, but otherwise it's no issue at all to put those in um, and, and it's just a really simple process. So, um, but otherwise, oh, yeah. if you are doing, you know, current observations, I'd recommend just using the application on your phone if you can, and that can just upload straight away as, as you found it, you know, in your hike or your walk somewhere. Um, and that's an easy thing to do. I don't know if you want to add anything else, Stephen. I think that was a pretty straightforward question. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I was just going to make a suggestion. If people are out there and they want to add, um, they're new dry and they want to do these um, uploads. Um, it, it's been very popular during the shutdown where I've seen um, people who are you know, avid phot photographers who have just discovered iNaturalist, they've been up uploading a lot of historic photographs. Uh, and if you're unsure on how to do that, we are actually holding a, um, a live workshop, which would be like a Zoom type meeting, but different from this one. And that'll be on Thursday night. Uh, and that's run by, that'll be run by a guy out of uh, Sydney, uh, Thomas who's a very experienced um, iNaturalist uh, and a really good communicator in that sort of um, uh, area. And you can ask questions uh, to him on that live if you want. We'll be hopefully we'll be casting that on YouTube as well. And you can find out details about that um, through our Facebook page on um, the great, if you just look up Great Southern Biblets or um, at GSB, so GSB Biblets, I'll put the, uh, that in the, ch in the chat, that link. And, uh, sign up to that and have a look because um, yeah, we, he did go over those sorts of things in our last one. So I'll do that now. Yeah, thanks for I that, did. Stephen. All right. Oh, you did it. What was the other question, uh, Larissa? Uh, there is another question from the Australian Citizen Science Association. How do you do pictures of mushrooms? Oh, Stephen, knows. I feel like Stephen, it's going over to Stephen, but Stephen knows oh, most about this. Mushrooms. Yeah, mushrooms, mushrooms are, are a little tricky. There's, um, I would su suggest, first of all, have a look at, um, uh, there's a fungi citizen science project, which gives you all these, um, these tips. It's called but fungi, what you can do um, is 
if you're taking photographs, um, some things are really good to take photographs with your phone. Um, some are not. Birds are often are not good to take with your phone. Um, but mushrooms are great. What you can do is a lot of the phones these days, which you can't see my phone again, because I've got this little funny thing uh, on the background, but um, they have a camera that reverses, um, looks up and both looks down. So um, you can take a photograph by getting your camera and looking at on your phone and taking your photograph and then reversing the camera so it's looking up and pop this under the, um, the mushroom. And then you get to see the structure of the gill cap. So the way the mushrooms work is they've got, they're a fruiting body for fungi. So they've got a stalk, which is called um, the stipe, and then they've got a cap, and then they've got the gills underneath or pores. So all those features, though, they're three features that are quite important. So you, a good picture of the cap, because often features on the cap can help identify the mushroom, and features on the, uh, the, the sexual um, stalk of the mushroom. Um, sometimes that can be very important, or often is very important, you know, the texture, um, sometimes some certain little structures on there can be important. And you'll learn that if you start doing some observations of mushrooms. But also whether it's actually got gills underneath or, or pores can be quite important. And there are two ways to do that. You can rip up the mushroom and take a photograph underneath, but you know, we don't really want to disturb things. Um, so what you can do is uh, um, either have a mirror and put the mirror underneath and take a photograph of the cat with the mirror underneath and get the whole thing in one shot. Um, if you don't want to carry a mirror, again, like I said before, just reverse the camera, pop your phone underneath and take a photograph. And then you can actually see what you're taking a photograph of as you do it. Um, and that's a little trick for you know a lot of things, but um, definitely with mushrooms, it works very well. And you can get those, whether it's a poor mushroom or whether it's got gills, what the color of the gills are and, and all these sorts of things. And you might be lucky enough to make another observation while you're underneath the gills. You might see a, a millipede or something um, as well. And then you get two for one again. Great, thanks for that, Stephen. Was there any All other right. questions, uh, Marissa, in the chat? Mm, not yet. That's fine. Did we have any other questions saved here? I think we had another one by Emily, didn't we? Oh, I think, sorry. Uh, I'm just seeing another question here, Cheryl. Sure. Can I read it? Uh, someone is asking, is the app free? That's a really great question. Yes, it is. Fortunately, um, iNaturalist is an open source platform, um, not open source, rather, it's an open platform um, and it's run in the US by the Academy of, uh, what is it, the Academy of what, Stephen, you remember? Of Sciences? Uh, okay. And, okay. and I think it's co-funded by National Geographic mm -hmm. in the US. Um, and yeah, it's completely free, available for anyone to join worldwide. And the other thing with that is uh, the data that's generated, it's not necessarily kept just by the US. It actually goes into something called the Atlas of Living Australia. If you've heard of that, that's um, a, a platform that collects data from around Australia, from scientists and citizen scientists that allows it to be stored, or that data is stored um, within Australia and will be used by Australian scientists as well. That is well. specific uh, to Australia though, so it's different mm, for each region, but yeah, that's yeah. true for Australia. Yeah, so if you're, if you're a member um, of iNaturalist in Australia, it's a good idea to set your um, your membership to the local node around the, the world. There's these different nodes. Um, there's one in Argentina, one in Australia, there's one in New Zealand, um, and then there, there are others around the world. And if you set your, your node to that particular spot, all your data gets collected locally. And sometimes that can help because some people get, uh, uh, some of the, the names used are, are different from the American system to the Australian system. So they, I think they tend to be a bit more consistent if you use the Australian node as well. Great. Hmm. Was there any other questions um, in the chat, Larissa? Uh, no, not in this moment. Not at the moment? I think we had another question um, we had saved previously though, um, by the name of Emily, which was, um, I've never used iNaturalist before. How can I find some resources, to, uh, sorry, resources to learn how to take pictures um, to be identified? So on our, um, through the, the Great Southern Wildlets, for example, um, which I discussed earlier, we have some great resources on there um, leading to the iNaturalist website. In fact, it actually has a lot of resources on, resources on there. Um, you know, if there's a particular subject area that you're interested in, again, if, you know, if it was fungi, for example, um, I think there's some great resources on there. Um, so I, I would encourage you actually to find, if you're, 
if you're trying to figure out how to identify particular things, I would encourage you to sort of do a bit of a Google search um, and see what's available in terms, of, in terms of those resources, because not just on iNaturalist, but on all sorts of other websites, there'd be great information specific to your region as well would really help. Um, otherwise, yes, on iNaturalist, there's lots of um, project posts and that sort of thing to help with ID. On the Great Southern Wire Blitz, we have lots of resources. Um, our, on our account pages like Activating Australians in Citizen Science, we often make those sorts of posts. Um, can you think of any other resources, Stephen? Um, yeah, I think that, that well, in the um, in the iNaturalist community, people are quite helpful and they will point you to the right directions. And they're often, a, depending on the state that you're in or the country that you're in, there's a lot of resources online that can help you with ID. Um, in South Australia, we have the SA Museum that has a whole a whole suite of um, online resources. Um, sometimes it can be a bit difficult to know where these things are. If you're in Australia though, or actually around the world, um, the CSIRO has a really good um, app for beginners called What Bug Is That? Where it will take you down to families, I believe. Um, and it'll go through a step-by-step -step key, which will ask you about different features uh, and get you to look at things like legs or wings or things like this. And um, it's a bit different from most keys where you, uh, you have to step, go through it step by step. This you can actually go on and just choose those particular um, aspects of the organism that you can see for, for invertebrates. Like if you can see that it's got uh, only two wings, oh, sorry, only yeah, two wings, one pair of wings, um, you can put that, at, that into the system and then see what comes up and that'll obviously take you to flies. Um, so yeah, that, that's a good resource for, for insects. Um, but there are a whole bunch of these sorts of things around. And, and if you look on the, uh, the iNaturalist um, side for resources, I think there's a, there's a section there for resources. It will take you to a whole bunch of resources that people have, have uploaded. Yeah, further to that, actually, I just it came to mind, um, you know, at least here in Australia, very often you can get free um, library memberships to, you know, from your local council. And you can go there and they'll have great textbooks for those sorts of things. But the other thing to remember is that with iNaturalist, you don't have to be an expert in terms of identifying whatever you find. There's a great community on there and nearly always people can help you to identify. Um, on top of that, you know, social media pages, like um, sites like Facebook, for example, have a lot of um, pages. I know there's one that I like to follow um, called uh, Amateur Entomology Australia which um, looks at insects found all over Australia, people have found, and they ask for IDs. And there's a great community on there to help with those sorts of things. But you don't have to have any background knowledge in that area. People can always help. But if you do want to learn more, yeah, I encourage you to just go out, have a good Google, you know, see if you can find some free um, resources from local councils or, you know, other, might be a, a, a local um, entomology or some ecological society that you could join and learn a bit more as well. So I think there'd be plenty of resources if you took some time to look around. Yeah, and the other thing as well, Seamus, um, once you start using the app, your knowledge does increase. And that's what the good thing about this sort of citizen science um, project is it's, it's about learning and uh, it's not about take um, where the community, the, the iNaturalist community just takes all your observations. It, it doesn't do that as well. It gives back to you by um, by you learning about different birds or insects or plants that you see out when you're doing your hikes. You'll start to recognise the plants around you and be able to name them. You'll be surprised how quickly that occurs. Um, I think we have another question here as well about um, recommendations for current projects. What's your favourite project, James? Or, or projects on the iNaturalist side? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Maybe I'll be biased and say uh, one of our projects, <laughs> which is many. Uh, what about the Mozzie Monitors project on there? That's a great project. Um, nothing it like it before project. it. All sorts of mosquitoes from all over Australia. Pretty damn interesting, isn't it, Larissa? Yes, it is. And actually, in the past month, uh, we are receiving uh, many new observations on Mozzie Monitors. At this moment, we have more than 1,000 observations of like 45 different species. So this is a great project. And of course, <laughs> we like this project. Um, but there, there is also like many different projects involving like birds, plants, fungi, you know, there, there's projects for everyone on, on YNET. 
I would I would give our our project a little bit of a plug as well. So in September we have our um, the, the Great Southern Bioblitz, which came from what I was talking about a bit earlier, the um, the City Nature Challenge. The Australian organisers got together. I think Seamus went through this and decided to put on a Great Southern Bioblitz. Initially it was going to be Australia, but it's we're going to have well over sixty different areas around the world, uh, and that's a great. The idea behind that is to get to actually get people involved. So it's a good sort of entry level thing to encourage people and encourage participation. So that's a great thing to, to join in. And we've got we've got areas all around Australia. We've got areas in South America. Um, just recently, we had Zimbabwe join um, just over the weekend, um, and we had a place in Queensland as well. So we've got a lot of lot of areas. It's good. It's a good um, entry point. Um, as far as other ones go, I would think um, one of my favourites at the moment is hungry parrots, um, where you can look at the interactions between plants and, and, and animals and, and birds. So that's a great one if you're out and you see a, a parrot feeding on a tree. That's a great you know, thing to put in there if you can find out the, the name of the plant. Or, or Oz pollinators, I mentioned that before. That's a great one. Really good project looking at plant insect interactions. Um, and it depends what your interest is. If your interest is, if you're interested in a particular park, if you're interested in a particular national park, often there are, and there are increasingly, or in, in South Australia anyway, most national parks or conservation parks have a project um, that's been put together by one of our local enthusiastic iNaturalists. Um, and join that. If it's your favourite park, one of my favourite parks is uh, just down the road from me, um, is Clearland. Um, I love the place. Uh, there's a couple of nice little walks off the side, not on the major track, um, and you can join that and contribute. Um, yeah, so I think they're great ones to get involved in if you do have a favourite park. Yeah, definitely. And again, look on the Our Naturalist website. Um, there's so many projects to join. And what's great about it is that um, depending on the parameters of that project, you know, for, for an observation, it, it will pick up those... Um, you know those parameters for that project so if you if you were looking at i don't know a particular bird in a particular area and that project that you joined only collects observations from that area it will just automatically pick that up and and add it to that project as well so it's pretty pretty cool um how it does that what i might do Seamus, if you want is um i'll just show you people how to find the um screen share do yeah, I was going to screen share. I don't know uh, how it's going to scale, but we can try if you like. Uh, it might not scale, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just give that a go for, for you guys and show you how to find projects. Um, I'm not sure how this will go um, with the streaming, but we'll um, we'll give it a go anyway. It might be cut off on some spots. But... Yeah, I'll try. Oh, it. Okay, it might be. No, it's working. It's working? Okay. So um, if you just go to this uh, section up here, there's a, there's a across the top of the... Um, uh, the page there's something called projects so if you just go down to projects and click on that then what should happen is you'll have a whole bunch of projects and obviously the city nature challenge is a very uh, important project for uh, engagement so that's come up as the banner um, and that's a project run out of the us um, and there's other ones as well so moth week and things like that so if you go down here and you can search you know, um, anything. Um, let's go moths. And it will show you all the projects on moths. Moths of Italy, Moth Week and things like that. Also, um, you should there should be a projects near me um, as well. Okay, I can't sort of see it. But there is a... Um... Might be maybe on your profile, Stephen. If you go to your profile, would it maybe recommend... Projects. Oh, no, I don't think it is, mate. I think it's in um, under pro under community and projects. Yeah, so um, I can't quite see it all too. Oh, here we go. No, okay. They're, they're usually, I thought there was a, a projects near me sort of tab, but. Um, you can look up uh, your state or um, an area um, and find out what's going on. Um, there's also, uh, you can actually search up users through here as well, people that you've seen on there that you want to ask some questions. Um, 
there you go. Here's some people. This guy here, Tony, he's from South um, Africa. He's uh, fairly um, fairly big in organising the City Nature Challenge in Southern Africa and com uh, networking communities. Um, but all sorts of people will show up there as well. Um, yeah, so I might just unshare. Hope that answers your question. Yes, great. So um, I think we had another question, didn't we? Um, by Sarah, which is, can I know if someone is using my photos for research? Now, with the iNaturalist platform, um, at least in Australia, as we noted before, um, all the data is transferred to ALA, Atlas of Living Australia. Um, and in that database, then pretty much it's accessible to anyone, scientists and the public included, and they can go in there and export that data for whatever use they want. Um, now, when it comes to sort of um, notifying the, those individuals who collected that data, I don't believe at least ALA doesn't have a function to, to, to sort of notify people that their data is being used. And or rather, I think it's just an agreement that you sign up to by using the iNaturalist platform that any data you upload is just freely available then for people to use and you won't necessarily know. Um, although, you know, it, I think it's down to the researcher. Um, at the moment, I'm doing my doctorate and I'm looking at using some ALA data and there's, as far as I know, there's no obligation for us to, um, you know, for example, to, 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 to let those people know. But... Um, yeah, I think maybe if you, you know, if there, if there was some future research and it was used, um, I think it would probably be cited under iNaturalist rather than the individual anyway. Um, I don't know. Do you know any information about that, Stephen? No, I'm probably not the person to ask. Um, I think uh, that there are things that are, I haven't actually used the data for um, research myself. I've used photographs, like, yes. Um, I have used photographs um, from the site and there's a copyright, there's, a, there's some issues around copyright. So the... Um, uh, yeah, there's some rights reserved for, for using your photos from the iNatural yeah. but The actual data itself, does, you, you yeah. know, it, you're not attributed to um, individually, it's, it's more like by iNaturalist. I, I think that, that there is an obligation there usually to, um, to uh, acknowledge the use of other people's data. And that would be done through acknowledging through um, iNaturalist. I, I could look that up and get back to you. Um, if you want to drop your email, your email in, I can find out because I haven't actually done that myself. There are issues around, obviously, copyright of photographs, and we'll cover that on Thursday. Um, and so it's probably not, it's a bit of a complicated issue, but usually it's, you get to set your own copyright, basically. Uh, you, you get to decide to choose who can use your photographs for different things. But around, actually about location, presence, absence data, um, yeah, I believe that would be you'd have, it would be acknowledged in, in any sort of research that you do that was obtained from my naturalist and there may be a requirement to um, have a list of people who contributed that I, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, again, in my experience, when I've tried to export data from, I, not directly from my naturalist, but through ALA from the iNaturalist platform, it's just attributed um, to iNaturalist. It's not attributed to any individual. Hmm. So... Yeah, you, I don't think there's any You have to appreciate, you say you have to appreciate that some of these um, these projects use data from thousands of observations. So individual attribution can be quite a complex thing. Um, yeah, it might be difficult. Yeah. All right. Well, um, do you have any other questions at all in the chat? Um, no. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, not really. There was another one asking about the location, but I think um, Stephen covered that. But did you want to uh, speak about it at all on the through Zoom, Stephen? Uh, application does location based. I'm not really sure what it's uh, what it's saying. I think it means like uh, you can share your location when you are sharing an observation on YNAC. You can share the GPS location uh, with your photo, with the, like the date and time when you when you yes the yeah and yeah also the GPS with the geographic yeah. location. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll cover. Yeah, yeah. This this I think I think what what um what the actual question might be looking at is sometimes like 
the the data itself is shared or location data is shared by default uh, unless it's a threatened or endangered species and then it will be obscured within the app itself there are three um, geo privacy settings there is open there is obscured and there is um, private and um, we'll go into this a bit bit, bit more on Thursday uh, well I won't but Thomas Thomas will because um, it's probably a bit too complex to cover in this but in short um, generally it's it's best to have most of your data open there are times when you want to restrict it to obscured which gives the data location within a 20 by 20 kilometer um, square randomly assigned and that's to obscure the actual location and that's uh, that is an automatic setting on a lot of endangered plants such as orchids or or near threatened species as well uh, like like animals and things like that uh, and that's obviously to obscure the um, the location so people don't come along and poach it steal orchids or, or, or kill animals um, now are there are, are, are there are other times that people might want to um, obscure their data when they're looking at um, observations in their own backyard they might want to set up a project in their own backyard and not share that they've got some expensive plant in there or or um, some feature in there that they don't want people to come along and um, um, take or just they want to have their own privacy which is fair enough um, and then you can do the same sort of thing you just set all your observations within your backyard as obscured and that will give a, um, a, a rough idea as to where you live which people can work out anyway they know what city you, you live in because all your observations are in that one city um, but often there's you know, thousands of people in that city so it's it's not a huge deal setting it to um, private is a bit of a concern because it, there's no real value in the data because it can't be accessed by people um, so we don't know um, roughly where the organism is, is, is captured. So you lose all that data around phenology when the plants are, occurred, when the flowers are coming out or when the plant, when the animals are breeding. Um, there are some instances when, when you might want to do that, but um, they can be quite specialized. So I probably won't go into them just, just, just now. I think that's what he was, what the question was. Yeah. All right, great. Well, if there's no other questions, I think that concludes tonight. Do you guys want anything else at all? No, I think that's um, that's um, this is a bit of a slight sort of introduction to what's going on in South Australia. So um, yeah, I think if people want to find out more about iNaturalist or um, or citizen science projects that are going on, they can join their local chapter of the Citizen Science Association. Um, we do have a Facebook um, a group which people can go on and discuss things. Uh, we'll put that in the chat. Which is added in the chat. Um, and that's uh, that's something that can be people have joined from around the world. Actually, we've got people from the US and from uh, uh, around Australia and, um, and and overseas and other places as well who have joined uh, from South South Southern Africa. So yeah, um, yeah, feel free to join that um, and uh, yeah, just um, have a look around for your lo local projects and, um, uh, and and join them. If you, if you wish to contribute to um, science in your everyday life. Yes, particularly the Great Southern Wildwoods, which is starting next month, not far away. Yes. So if yes. you want to join on that, um, yeah, as we said before, jump on iNaturalist as soon as you can and um, join us for that project. So it's going to be pretty exciting. And one, one, one thing before we go, you can actually send put in photographs of mozzies once you've squashed them as well. <laughs> yeah. From that. <laughs> so please, please send your mozzie photographs in from around us because um, we really do um, enjoy the diversity that we're getting. We're getting some really lovely mozzies. And if you've got that, if you don't like mozzies and you think that they, they're terrible organisms, have a look at mozzie monitors. It will change your mind. <laughs> so I also would like to thank everyone for watching, for supporting us and for attending this event today as well and please follow us on social media to get the next updates and to find out more on you know how to share your pictures beyond instagram and support some citizen science programs thank you everyone thanks everyone good night thank you <laughs>